Okay, I just wanted to thank um, the organizers for um, the opportunity to talk today at this important uh, symposium. And I think similar as to many of us um, after um, March of uh, 2020, we started to think about what we actually could contribute from our expo expo um, consortia and projects towards the um, current pandemic that is still ongoing. And what I will be presenting today is basically um, some of the thoughts that we had on, on how we actually could use Exposome technology and methodologies into um, pandemic preparedness. Um, what I'm going to address today are basically um, the issue of how our environment, our Exposome, can uh, influence the infection probabilities, so our chance to actually contract the uh, virus. Um, how potentially these uh, exposures and circumstances could actually influence the severity of COVID-19 disease. And lastly, something that I'm starting to think uh, about a lot more, and I will come back to the last part of my presentation, um, how actually the environment will influence the course of recovery of many of the COVID-19 patients that we currently have. Now, if we think about um, the COVID-19 um, disease and, and how infections occur, um, just have this kind of um, deck drawn out in, in a sense where we basically have a start of an uh, epidemic um, that can be influenced by early or late lockdown measures. And together, basically, these determine basically the contact mixing rate. And of course, if you think about the contact mixing rate together with the uh, proportion of infected people within the community, that basically gives you from an exposure science standpoint, an estimate of your SARS-CoV-2 exposure. Of course, then when we think about what the infection rate will be, that is then basically a resultant of what that SARS-CoV-2 exposure is, um, together with the number of susceptible persons within the community, and the probability of contracting infection per, per contact. Of, of course, after contracting the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, then we basically have different um, outcomes that are possible, as Mark Tompkins already um, illustrated as well, that could be asymptomatic, that could be mild, severe, or unfortunately death from uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. There's also something else that is ongoing, and that is that when we actually have these measures to um, rightfully try to curtail the virus, it means that these lockdown measurements will also have effects on our lifestyle. And so there are knock-on effects that I will talk about as well. Now, when we think about where can the exposome that's illustrated here by this little graph here can actually influence, then um, it's actually at, at many different levels. At first, it's already with the start of the epidemic, where due to nature degradation, climate change, the pressure on land use and the close contact between animals and humans actually can put pressure on um, contracting the virus or starting the epidemic. Um, I will show you later that exposome variables can really influence also the SARS-CoV-2 exposure if we think about how our communities are built up, our social environments can have a large influence in that. Of course, when we think about um, the chance of getting infected, then there is a possibility that environmental exposures actually make us more prone to contract the virus, as Mark Tompkins was talking about as well, from air pollution and PFAS. Lastly, or not lastly, but um, also the exposome or environmental factors can influence basically the course of the disease. And then we can talk about the knock-on effects. So um, after the pandemic, we basically started to think about um, how to pull research together and, and see how we could actually utilize our resources. And that has culminated basically in four research projects that we're working on now, which is basically looking at the influence of the exposome, including air pollution on COVID-19. Uh, and that's both the probability of infection as well as the severity of COVID-19 disease. As I said, um, we currently have patients that are luckily recovering from a COVID-19 hospitalization, 
Uh, but what we see is that many of these patients have lesions to the lung, uh, the cardiovascular system, and there's also suspicion for brain lesions after recovery. And there's a large question now how basically um, these patients will recover or that actually these lesions will re result in chronic diseases later in life. As I said, there are the knock-on effects of the corona pandemic and its uh, lockdown measure measures. And that's basically what we study in the COVID impact study, which I will show some results from later. The last one really um, relates back to um, the presentations of yesterday, some of them about the power of uh, metabolomics. And um, what we started to do is actually use metabolomic scans of uh, on COVID-19 patients to see basically which biological perturbations occur um, and see if we actually could mimic those um, effects on, in experimental twins, in this case, blood vessels on a chip. Now, um, I said that I would talk about some of the methodological issues. And um, if we think about how the exposome actually could in, uh, affect the SARS-CoV-2 infection or COVID-19 progression, then in principle, you could hypothesize um, two main uh, ways that that could happen. One is that there is an interaction between our environment and the relationship between SARS-CoV-2 exposure and the outcome. The other possibility is certainly also possible that these environmental factors actually are related to underlying factors that make people more susceptible for uh, contracting disease or having a worse outcome of the disease. Uh, and that would be an indirect effect that actually would be mediated via um, some health outcome uh, displayed here as option two. Now, um, that um, our environment can really um, affect the susceptibility for infections um, is something that we, we do know. Um, if you actually go to uh, the website of the Institute for Health Metrics Evaluation, uh, which does the global burden of disease, um, and search on respiratory infections and tuberculosis, uh, which of course, all, this is a, a mix of, of bacterial and virus infections, you can see that there are certain factors that actually make people more prone to these infections, of which particulate matter is one of the top factors that actually have been listed and found previously. So there is some evidence that indeed environmental factors in particular, particulate matter could be important in the susceptibility for infection. That has generated um, a lot of interest into air pollution and COVID-19 disease, uh, both in the Netherlands, uh, in Italy and the US, and also in the UK, where um, many news articles and, and papers have uh, appeared that were addressing the issue of air pollution and COVID-19. Now, um, I'm just pointing out to this uh, report that we just finished uh, a month ago um, for the European Parliament uh, on air pollution and COVID-19 disease. Um, there's a, um, a QR code on, on this page, so you can scan this or contact me for, for this report, uh, which actually lists a lot of the details that I will be going over in, in some detail today. The, the main problem, however, of addressing this issue is that if we take this model one, uh, where we have SARS-CoV-2 exposure, which leads to an infection and, and then leads to COVID-19 progression, and if we regard, in this case, air pollution as a um, interaction term, then um, the problem that we have in these disease models that we are currently using is that we actually have no estimate of what SARS-CoV-2 exposure of the population is. And so in that regard, from a statistical standpoint, this actually makes it very difficult to actually study the relationship between air pollution and SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 progression, and by extension also how the exposome is related to these two outcomes. If you actually look statistically at this model, um, in the absence of having a good estimate of SARS-CoV-2 exposure in the population on an individual level, then you could only reach a unbiased estimate of your contribution of air pollution if the SARS-CoV-2 exposure would be constant and if there is no relationship between SARS-CoV-2 exposure and air pollution statistically. So 
um, that is the only way that we actually could get an unbiased estimate. At the moment that there is a positive um, correlation between SARS-CoV-2 exposure and air pollution, uh, we would actually get a biased estimate where some of the effect estimate of SARS-CoV-2 exposure would actually be absorbed by the interaction term. In the case that SARS-CoV-2 is actually variable in time and space, then the steady state model that many of these studies are using uh, are actually inappropriate and we actually need to look more into infectious disease models and integrate actually our chronic disease epidemiology air pollution uh, field into those models. Just to illustrate that this is an issue is that I'm just showing you here the um, COVID-19 patients in March of um, 2020 in the Netherlands where the outbreak of COVID-19 um, SARS-CoV-2 was basically in the southeast of the Netherlands where it, it, the, the main infection started. However, if you look at the air pollution map of the Netherlands um, displayed next to it, you can see that actually the southeast of the Netherlands is a area of um, lower air quality because of the intensive farming that is going on in that part of the country. So that means actually that there is already a statistical um, correlation between where the pandemic started and where air pollution is higher. Showing you here on the right side, basically the COVID-19 patient distribution, uh, but this, at this time at the end of 2020 in September or October, where you can see that the distribution of COVID-19 patients really changed and where now the majority of the patients are seen into the largest cities of the Netherlands in, in the West. And so also the other part where we argue that if it's variable and it's not um, stable in time and space, then the models that we actually currently are using are quite problematic in actually trying to get an unbiased estimate of the effect. Now, we've been thinking very hard about how to get around that. And there is a very nice paper by Jan van der Broeke and Neil Pierce um, that basically argued that uh, perhaps we can actually use test negative designs. And a test negative epidemiological design is where we are actually looking at people that tested positive for the virus versus people that are testing negative to the virus. And by constraining the time in which these tests were happening and also constraining the geographical area, we can try to minimize the bias that would occur from the fact that the exposure is not constant and over time and that there is a correlation uh, between the fact that we want to see and the exposure to the virus. So I really recommend you to read this paper to understand more about the issues about this model. It's certainly not a panacea. It doesn't solve all the questions that we have and all the possible biases that could occur. Now, we were able to actually start to apply this test negative design to um, the UK Biobank um, study together with my colleagues at Imperial College London uh, with Mark chabelle fiam in, in particular, and this is what we published in uh, late of 2020. And basically what we were able to do is basically do an exome-wide study where we basically took demographic variables, social variables, health risk variables, uh, medical um, variables, and environmental factors, in this case being air pollution, and basically did a number of tests listed here on the right side from one to four, where the first ones are really to, de to de detect biases in the testing regimes. So this is more testing who actually got tested versus who got not tested um, and who tested positive and negative against the non-tested. That's really to understand um, selection into test systems. Um, but the number four is really where we focused on and that is basically the question um, being if you're tested, so this is conditionally on being tested, um, what are the factors that determine basically if you test positive versus negative? And if you look at that analysis, then there are a few factors that come up. Um, that is demographics being male. Um, it is ethnicity um, that is one of the factors that is strongly associated with having a positive test. And um, air pollution in general uh, was negative with the exception of PM 2.5 absorbance, which is the um, basically black smoke uh, or 
elements of carbon um, that is mostly related to, to diesel exhaust. That's interesting because most of the previous studies actually had focus on NOx and PM2.5, where we actually see in the test negative design uh, no factor coming up. So when I then move onwards to start addressing basically how does uh, the exposam relate to COVID-19 progression? So this has to do with the right side of this picture. Is there an influence of uh, a higher likelihood of a um, worse outcome of the infection when you have certain attributes? Um, again, we were able to study this in the UK Biobank. And the reason that we did this analysis is that this was the first time that these questions actually could be answered on an individual level. There have been many studies um, on air pollution and other factors that have been done on an ecological level um, where there may be some problems with ecological fallacies. So when we did this analysis again, we did an exposome wide analysis, again, looking at the same variables that I uh, showed you for the test negative um, design. And what we see here, and this is coming out now in the European Journal of Epidemiology, um, that the factors that actually seem to be related to uh, the worst outcome, in this case, COVID-19 mortality, that age, sex, ethnicity, socioeconomic position, smoking, obesity, diabetes, respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, and other immune diseases are related to a worst outcome of the disease. Um, these are factors that actually um, have been found before. This is uh, showing you the Nature paper of Williamson, um, that looked into the health records of 70 million people in the UK um, and actually found the same factors that we actually see within the UK Biobank uh, of age, sex, obesity, ethnicity, uh, again, a socioeconomic position, diabetes, respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, and other immune disease. Just to be um, clear here, if we actually look at an individual level within the UK Biobank, we don't see a signal of air pollution towards COVID-19 mortality. Now, what is interesting is just thinking back at the two models that I just uh, proposed in the beginning, that the exposome and exposome factors could actually have an effect through underlying morbidities. Uh, and that is certainly a poss possibility that, that is here. If we look at the factors that we found to be associated with um, a higher chance of COVID-19 mortality within the UK Biobank, listed here um, in order, um, you can see that there are many of these factors that actually have large contributions from the environment. Again, switching to the Institute for Health Metrics evaluation uh, over here, the GBD, I just plotted here the GBD results for cardiovascular disease, for diabetes, for chronic respiratory disease. And again, you can see that there are many environmental factors related to these underlying morbidities, uh, most notably air pollution that is related to all of these. So, in conclusion of that is that air pollution may still play a role in it, but it's very difficult to actually get a precise estimate of what the effect is on COVID-19 infection and morbidity due to some of the methodological issues that I talked about. Now, switching a little bit here is that, of course, um, we are all affected um, by the pandemic due to the fact that we have um, restrictions and have to change our life habits. And that has actually led to changes in our social structures, insecurities, um, stress, as well, uh, and so on, but also in changes in lifestyle when we think about sedentary behavior, when we think about decreasing physical activity. And there have been now many studies that actually have shown that indeed uh, a lot of the lifestyle factors have changed due to the pandemic. And the question, of course, is what does that do to health? Now, we just started, uh, this is led by Andrew Husseva Institute, um, the COVID uh, impact study, which basically, um, since the pandemic started, started to follow um, in three prospective studies among adults, amongst children, and about uh, in a rural area, uh, in a monthly follow up, how physical activity, lifestyle, well being, sleep, social interactions, mental health changed due to the COVID 19 measures that have been taken in the Netherlands. And we hope to basically analyze that shortly to get to new insights. As I said before, um, one of the other areas that I think we should uh, start looking more into is that hopefully we are turning the corner on the pandemic in a several months from now, although that's still a uncertainty. 
Uh, what we do know is that we will have many patients that have gone through an infection that have had mild or more severe symptoms of COVID-19. And what we see, and this is together with Freda's Mohamed Hussein, um, that if we look at the MRI scans of these patients, we see um, quite severe lesions to the lung and to the cardiovascular system. And so we are now following up these patients to see if what the prognosis is of that damage and if there is recovery or that it actually sets people up for the development of chronic disease later in life and you can think about CBD. Um, we actually are using exposome measures in that to see which chemicals of air pollution or physical activity and other factors actually play a role in the outcome long term of a COVID-19 uh, disease and, and how that develops uh, later in life. So when I go back to the original picture that I had on um, COVID-19, you can see that um, the exposome could actually influence all parts of this DAG um, significantly. And so there's really room for much research on this topic. Um, I'm just going to finish off by, by basically going to the conclusions. Um, so if we think about the exposome, then, I mean, there is reason enough to assume that the exposome has an influence on SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 severity. I just do, do want to stress that it's very difficult with the data that we have at hand to actually come to causal associations. And that estimation of the magnitude of the effect is quite difficult due to the fact that it's very difficult to actually encompass the dynamics of the infection into these analyses. So are these analyses important? Is it that we actually should do this research? The answer is yes, we should, because it helps us for future pandemic preparedness. But I'm going to say that we have time to do this. Um, it's not going to determine the exit strategies or treatment at this moment. Um, and that is also what we warned about um, in the paper that we published in ERF, in the European Respiratory Journal, that mm -hmm. we still have to do the right research and do due diligence to try to come up with a good research and scientific rigor in when we do this research. Of course, in the end, the fact is that air pollution is, and reducing air pollution is always important given the fact that we have 9 million uh, uh, deaths per year worldwide. Just to, to say that if you want to know more about pandemic preparedness and environmental issues in pandemic preparedness, there is a paper that we wrote from the HERA consortium led by Robert Baruki uh, here, um, and um, that you can read basically how that affects. Just to finish off, to show you the power of using metabolomics, what you see here is a display on the left side of um, the level of oxylipins. These are uh, inflammatory peptides um, that you can detect in patients with COVID-19. You can see that these increase after the day of hospitalization and are associated with worse outcome of the patients. What is interesting is that we have been able to take down the plasma of the patients and diffuse that through blood vessels that we have on a chip and are able then to detect, and that's seen in panel B, um, the same oxylipins going up. And we see that if we perfuse that with COVID-19 plasma, that it is much more stronger than if we actually do that with control plasma. And that actually gives us the opportunity, and that links back to the question how we actually could use ferrets for looking at these interactions. Now we actually can start infusing other chemicals, or in this case, uh, inhibitors, to see if there are drugs that actually could uh, reduce the effect of COVID-19 in patients. What you see here is that when we actually take in a an inhib inhibitor, that much of the effect that we see from COVID-19 plasma towards the endothelial cells of the blood vessels can be mediated or can actually be counteracted by uh, putting the inhibitor in. I just wanted to thank um, the different people that have contributed to this research um, from my own group at the Utrecht University. Uh, the people at Imperial College, uh, my group at the Academic Hospital, and also the people at Leiden University who do a lot of the metabolomics. Uh, I wanted to thank everybody and just put up my email uh, because all data that we have on COVID-19 is fair and open. And so if you have questions or want to work with the data, please feel free to reach out uh, to us.
So thank you very much.